Uh, hi, thanks for the opportunity to share some uh, work that's ongoing uh, in cystic fibrosis, uh, which is a, um, we're able to go to the extremes of phenotype patients at UNC and pick the extremes of the extremes, stratify by gender and key genotypes, the risk and non-risk in the thing, and got uh, Debbie Nickerson's uh, group to RSNG sequence of 370 patients across this 300 KB region. And interestingly enough, we actually added a, uh, what is that, 116 SNPs that were of a sufficient uh, frequency to cause imputation. By adding these additional SNPs in, we were able to get uh, a better imputation and actually the association p-value in this set of uh, patients homozygous for Delta F actually uh, got stronger. I will say that, uh, um, I will say that uh, these additional SNPs, uh, novel SNPs, in fact, uh, overlay and are in or near these open chromin and the regulatory domains. And I can say that in pilot preliminary work with Ann Harris, we've at least one of these, uh, we've already identified at least one strong enhancer with an effect of 20-fold uh, uh, effect on expression of at least one of the genes in this region. And so uh, the home run would obviously be if one of these uh, SNPs modified the effect of that uh, enhancer, and we're going to work on that. We're obviously going to follow this whole region up in a systematic fashion and try to identify the regulatory elements. Cis interactions, uh, as uh, Steve was talking about last night, uh, by using a chromosome confirmation captor, try to determine the function of these regulatory elements. And then we downstream have human airway cells which we'll be able to do a variety of uh, experiments to try to understand the uh, mechanism. A second finding from the original 3,500 patients was a very strong linkage peak on chromosome 20 in about 500 um, a twin, a twin and sib pairs from Hopkins. You can see that the LOD score is uh, almost um, five, and if you uh, actually put in a uh, uh, BMI as a um, covariate, uh, the, the LOD score is o greater than five. As you can see here, this is again over uh, a, a non-coding region. There are some interesting genes in the region which do relate to lung function, structure, and, and inflammation. Uh, we were able to go uh, under the linkage peak and look in the association patients from uh, UNC in Toronto, and for, for a region-wide analysis, we were able to replicate this linkage peak uh, in, in that population. I will see it, say as a point of provocation, we're currently doing um, a study with uh, uh, Ed Silverman looking at COPD patients and trying to look at commonality of SNPs and genes that we find in CF and uh, in COPD, and uh, our second-ranked SNP uh, happens to lie uh, in this region. So we think that's a very uh, provocative observation. Gary Cutting is leading the charge on this, and we'll be sequencing a large number of patients across here. The concept is that probably can't explain this by common variants. There are probably rare variants in here, so it may be a combination of common and rare variants that are, that are calling the tune. Uh, we have participated in the exome sequence. This is work that's largely derived from uh, Mary Emans and Mike Bamshed in, uh, in Seattle, where we tried to look at the age of onset of pseudomonas infection. Early age of onset of pseudomonas is a bad prognostic sign, and we had some of our patients uh, in this exome. And as you can see here, uh, Mary did the, the traditional burden analysis uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, polymorphisms that were less than uh, 0.125, found one, a clear outlier on the QQ plot uh, in 91 exomes, uh, went to uh, uh, 696 additional patients, and Sanger sequenced this uh, gene, DN, DCTN4. As you can see here, if you have a, a missense mutation in, in the DCTN4, you have much earlier onset of pseudomonas than if you do not have. So this was a, a replicated finding, and this uh, work is actually uh, in press in Nature Genetics. I will point out that we have well-phenotyped patients with these other uh, disorders, uh, CF-related diabetes, 
uh, 25 to 30 percent in adults. Uh, Scott has already shown that the top ranked SNP that associated with the CF related diabetes is TCS7L2, that old familiar one that causes a type 2 diabetes. There is a data forthcoming now from the GWAS analysis, and he has identified at least two other type 2 diabetes genes are associated with this, as well as a novel Asayut transporter. Uh, it turns out that Asayut transporters are clearly associated with meconium ileus, as published uh, just a few months ago in Nature Genetics, uh, patients who are born with meconium ileus. And it turns out that there is the same solute transporter affecting meconium ileus and uh, diabetes in CF patients, suggesting the possibility of a, a pleiotropy, which we think is quite interesting. 5% of CF patients develop portal hypertension. We've already shown from Canada Gene Studies that if you carry one copy of the alpha antiprotease Z allele, you have a four to eight-fold increased risk of developing liver disease if you have CF, and the effect size is bigger than the effect of the Z allele in uh, uh, patients who have alpha protease uh, deficiency. So basically, we think that there are already some neat things going on. CF is now becoming a complex genetic disease, even though it's driven by monogenic re recessive disorder. As I said, we have an additional 3,500 patients who are undergoing GWAS. We have GWAS data in these other uh, heritable uh, traits. And so um, we think this uh, population is a fertile ground for uh, discovery. And of course, acknowledgments all the people uh, in the consortium uh, support for the USCF Foundation, which has really funded a lot of the GWAS stuff, the help of uh, NHI, NIH, RISNG stuff, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I wonder, and perhaps Nancy or Peter could comment, how would the strategy like this work in this, the large cohorts we are discussing with exome data, where the main effect size gene is probably lower penetrance than CF, and the Total numbers, the ends will be smaller, though the overall numbers are again large. And can we do GWAS? Will we be okay with GWAS and exome data, or do we need whole genome sequence data? Would it work? <laughs> uh, I mean, in terms of GWAS, a lot of the action has been in SNPs that aren't in genes. So I think there are big advantages of doing whole genome. I, mean, I don't know whether we're going to discuss it specifically. My view on sequencing of large, if we're going to do a large project, sequencing of large cohorts, I, I think the arguments for doing whole genome sequencing are very, very strong over exomes. I mean, not, not specifically for this reason, but it's one of them. Um, we will be doing everything with whole genome sequencing at some point in the relatively near future, I think. And if we think about the value of such a resource, if we were to do a large project just on exomes, then we'll be very frustrated in two or three years' time because there'll be all sorts of stuff that we don't have in the data. So I, I really think if we're thinking of a large project, it makes so much sense to think in terms of genome sequencing rather than just XM sequencing. Can I, sure. I mean, I'm going to shift back to a, uh, a different point that I think Mike raised very nicely, and that is the ability to look at related phenotypes and ask the question, because if pathways are real, they probably aren't working in isolation only in this disease and in this particular setting. And I think it's, it's a very nice example of you're talking about going from CF to COPD. Yes, they are very different configurations, but they most likely are going to share certain things. And so in thinking about the larger structure or the larger study, I, I'd like to just put on the table that I think that that would be a very useful and an important criteria to consider, that would be these sort of overlapping outcomes where not only are you looking at one particular outcome, but something that may be related that allows you to do this. And we know that in the history of GWAS, I mean, we've been lumpers to find things, whether it's within cancers or BMI or inflammatory diseases, but that by lumping, we're able to have the numbers to be able to really achieve a level of discovery that pinpoints new pathways or new places to go after. And I think, and then, you know, all the mapping and the exciting stuff that goes afterwards. But I would just like to put that on the table and emphasize that, because I think that was really an important point. Nancy. I think these findings also raise some interesting points, again, around, you know, back to um, 
efficacy and even adverse events. Um, so here you have TCF7L2 coming up um, in the context of cystic fibrosis-associated diabetes. Um, when hypertension, for example, is, is a, an adverse event in treatment with VEGF inhibitors, um, might, not, might that be another way of identifying hypertension genetic risk factors? Similarly, you know, when we, with the efficacy, I think part of what will be the genetic, will, have, will be the genetic risk factors that we find that affect efficacy will just be about the genetic basis, the, the underlying genetic basis for the phenotype. You basically sort of have to fix what's broken in order to have um, good outcomes. And, and so these are all, these cohorts that are well phenotyped when there's outcome data, um, we just have that much more leverage to getting at some of the same underlying questions that we we think we want to get at with just the disease phenotypes. So I think it's really critical to have the, the outcomes phenotypes um, for in, in these cohort studies. Question. Uh, on the TCF7L2, um, you said it was the strongest variant for diabetes in, in CF patients, but it's the strongest variant for diabetes, at least identified by GWAS, in non-CF patients. So is the, is the odds ratio or the, the effect much larger? The, the, the effect size is uh, four to six times greater in CF patients than it is in general population. Really? So it's like an odds ratio of like three? three, three is, yes. No it's, um, four, it's actually four to six. Really? It's a little complicated because CF patients get steroids to treat their lung disease and if you control for that as uh, an effect that induces diabetes and take that out the the effect is uh, is actually close to to five somewhere between five and six so that all so, covers to around four cool and and along the lines of what Nancy just said so so has has anyone then looked at steroid induced diabetes in non CF patients in in relation to TCF 7 L2 I, I know that it's been looked at in relation to metformin um, but I haven't heard of it being looked at in relation to steroid-induced diabetes. Oh, I'm sure it has. Uh, Scott Blackman at Hopkins is really leading this charge, and I, I can't answer. I'm sorry, Terry, I can't answer your question. Yes, and this, yes. Is, and this is in CF patients who obviously do not have uh, obesity. <laughs> uh -huh. yes. So despite the fact that they're not obese, in fact, if anything, they're undernourished, they still have the development of diabetes associated with this polymorphous. Other comments, questions? So one of the, the reasons to have a, a you know, classic Mendelian-ish disease on, on the agenda was to address how can we address Mendelians in, in a, a large sample. You know, even in a, in a million people, you're not going to have many CF patients. So, so it may be that, you know, Obviously, no one study is going to answer every question, but um, are, is there some value in looking at phenotypes of heterozygote carriers, it sounds like there is, as, as well as, you know, form fruits, et cetera? So could you comment on that? You, the, the specific question you want me to ask is... So how, how would we work in addressing Mendelian diseases in a essentially population-based or unselected cohort? I think that's, that's the question. Well, I, I think it would be extraordinary to take all of the families that are well phenotyped and do um, uh, sequencing so you have affected and you have parents. And um, um, for, with CF patients, and you can control for the CFTR genotype, and I think it would probably provide extraordinarily useful information as we're dissecting through all the additional genetic variation that we're going to identify. Um, I mean, the, the chromosome 20 region is a, a great example um, that, that's, that's going to need to be sequenced. So the well, another potential application would be to reduce the multiple testing burden. So you can imagine that if you were to look at, say, kind of hepatic or pancreatic phenotypes of interest, uh, you could argue that because of the mutations in CFTR, I mean, the, the side effects in some CF patients of those things, that that would be a logical thing to look at when you're aggregating 
you know, across pathways or across side effects or organ system side effects. When will it come? So uh, one thing about Mendelian disease is not all made equally. So we have Mendelian disease actually gave you a complex phenotype. Actually the lung phenotype in CF, you can call it complex disease almost. So, so that's where the rare Mendelian disease can link to the common complex disease. Um, we can even make some major theme to cause common complex disease. For instance, the CF, the overlapping with the COPD, maybe it's about the lung injury. It's all some kind of lung injury. And after lung injury, there's a fibrosis process going on. So maybe it's a fibrosis. Uh, so, so in that way, if we can start to link or mix the data from rare Mendelian disease, which has complex phenotype, with a common complex disease, um, we may actually, find they can fit each other uh, and move the field a lot faster than, faster than simply moving, you know, separate the two fields uh, and not to combine them together. Eric. Maybe Nancy, I'll put you on the spot. I'm kind of amazed that we, we, we act like there's Mendelian diseases over here and sort of Peter Vischer polygenic disease over here and there's nothing in the middle. And I'm wondering if we need to be um, reinitiating old discussions about oligogenic models of inheritance and you know even, even two genes. There's very few of us even doing two gene models. And we need to come, come back to that. If we really had a very large sample size where we could seriously address these questions, maybe we could think about two and three sort of oligogenic models of inheritance and, and disease susceptibility. But before you answer, let me just add, you know, there are complex diseases like autism, where there's also evidence that genetic mod common genetic modifiers play, may play a role. So in the area of neurodevelopment, there's a lot of evidence that this could be the case. I, so, yeah, I mean, we used to think that oligogenic was, I mean, recently have been thinking that oligogenic uh, modeling was, you know, a, sort of a way of fooling ourselves about things being simpler than they really were. But, but we do recognize gradations. I mean, even among our complex phenotypes, you know, there's Hirschsprung's and there's Crohn's disease. And there's type 2 diabetes. I mean, the, the, there, if you consider the, the amount of genotyping that had to be done to discover a certain number of genetic risk factors, it's very different for those phenotypes. Um, a, approximately the same number of genetic risk factors have been established for Crohn's disease as type 2 diabetes, you know, highly significantly and reproducibly associated with disease, but it's taken you know, about an order of magnitude more genotyping, probably, to do that for type 2 diabetes than Crohn's disease, at least, I think. Um, and that, that's a function and part of the genetic architecture that we are starting to get an understanding of. And, yeah, you could think about things more in the Hirschsprung range if you wanted to get you know, maybe take a shot at a complete understanding of something that was intermediate between complex and more Mendelian. Well, I mean, I, I completely agree with Nancy about type 2 and Crohn's. I just, I see that as both having complex genetic architecture. One of them just has more larger effects. Well, they're not large, but uh, less more uh, slightly larger effect sizes than the other one. Are there any examples of two gene diseases? Three. You asked. Or three gene diseases, or five <laughs> gene diseases? <laughs> five. <laughs> Let's do two. There must be easy. I don't know. There must be easy. Well, well tell us what they are. Two. 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 Two.
I want to get at what Eric was trying to get at when you were asking. Do you have specific examples in mind? No, I no, but I'm wondering how many people we're not doing it. We're not doing it. We tend to look at them in the alien. We tend to look at them as polygenic, and we, we're not fitting, or we haven't been fitting. In the old segregation analysis days, we did fit two gene models, but we've gotten away from that. And I'm wondering if we stop fitting sort of one locus at a time, we go back to, and maybe it's a way of better integrating families, is it, should we go back to it, integrating sort of countable numbers of individual genes? Whether it's two, three, four, I don't know. But we tend to look at one locus at a time. And I, and I wonder if it's a I, way I, of I, adding I, information by looking I, at I two, think three, there's four. The, I think there's an extraordinarily good example for the ciliopathy, filled with ciliopathies. I started off working in motile ciliopathies because cilia work in the airway as mucociliary clearance. It turns out that there are sensory cilia on almost every cell in the body and you get mutations in genes there, and you get there are at least you know, eight different types of Bardet Beetle syndrome and renal cystic disease, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, Friedhelm Hildebrand up at uh, Ann Arbor has got this chart where he talks about the end result clinical phenotype and how many of the different genes in the pathways contribute to these net things. And so I think the ciliopathies are probably a good example of the kind of things that lead to similar but different clinical phenotypes. Chris. I, have a, I have a suggestion. Um, so um, Gail has, has inspired me to think about a quantitative trait, um, which, which is of great significance to, to all of us who go to primary care offices, which is LDL cholesterol. It's obviously one of the largest uh, treated conditions, and there's a huge, uh, there, there are a limited number of Mendelian uh, you know, alleles that, that impact LDL. In fact, in so, some of the data that we're putting together in the exome sequencing project for LDLR, that is being confirmed. There's not a huge number of new genes. ApoB, LDLR are, are the drivers, and yet also in the more complex, um, less extremes of LDLR, we, we know from the uh, global lipids that there's, what, 35, 35 GWAS SNPs. So, this, that may be a nice quantitative trait, and others like that to, to look at, at this question of, the, of where the Mendelian begins and the, the more complex um, interactions of genes um, begin as well. Lynn, you had a comment. I was just going to mention I, that there are at least a few cases of truly digenic uh, diseases. Um, retinitis pigmentosa, pigmentosa has a form that is digenic. Uh, I think Bardet beetle also. Um, so one could set up a, an experiment basically taking the whole cohort of say RP cases where there are a couple of dozen genes at least uh, and, and ask the question how hard would it be uh, to find those cases that are actually digenic. So it would, it would, it would be an it, I think an interesting experiment that it would at least begin to address that question and that issue. Thank you. I think we are taking a break now, a long break. We have till 10.15. Thank you.